you know, though, that there's going to be a plenary session right here uh, being hosted by my colleague Terry Martin, and he assures me that he has quite an interesting panel, so I would stay exactly where you are if I was you. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Edith. Thank you so much, Edith, and uh, uh, thank you all for, for staying with us. I understand you've been here now for more than two hours in this room. If you're going to take a little break, um, I see a few people leaving, that's okay, but please feel free to come back and join us because we have a really, really interesting session that's about to start right now. It's really great for me to be here again. Okay. The central theme at this year's Deutsche Welle Global Media Forum. An abundance of content. A wide variety of information sources. The modern media landscape seemingly offers many choices. But is it really as diverse as it appears? A small number of companies monopolize the digital media. They tailor content to their audience's specific needs and expectations. Users are caught in self-contained news bubbles, diminishing the chances for meaningful conversation. And those who lack access to the new media are at risk of being shut out from public discourse entirely. Join our discussion. Media monopolization and the fight for audiences. How to avoid information inequalities in the modern media landscape. Here at the Global Media Forum 2018. So we're just setting the stage for this, this event. We have four amazing panelists who are going to give us insights into exactly what you just heard in that trailer. Now, I want to point out that this event right now is being live streamed around the world, uh, but not everyone in the world, unfortunately, is able to watch because in some countries, this live stream is being blocked by governments or access to it is not included in a user's data plan or the digital infrastructure in the country or maybe even just plain electricity isn't there to support those who might want to watch this and benefit from it. Or perhaps the algorithm that some people are using would never lead them to discover the global media forum when they go searching for information. Between continents and even within countries, there are massive inequalities when it comes to media access. And when it comes to media production, the imbalance is even more profound. And this is a problem because social progress depends in part on assuring that media access and production is not monopolized. So how can we assure that this doesn't happen? What can we do to harness the power of media to overcome information inequalities and serve the common good? That's what we're talking about right now at the Global Media Forum. It's the essential question. And we're going to be discussing that with four very interesting guests. I'd like to introduce them right now. I'd ask you to please hold your applause until they've all taken their seats and then we'll give them applause together because I have a, couple, I have a position statement to attach to each one of these guests. As I was preparing this, I asked them about their, what they thought about our topic and I've boiled it down to just a couple of sentences which I'll share with you as I introduce them. I'd like to begin with Benedict Autret. She is Head of Strategic Relations dealing with news at Google. Ms. Autret reminds us that Google's stated mission is to organize information and make it universally accessible and useful. That, however, has become increasingly difficult, she says, due to the proliferation of misleading content and disinformation. Sung Joon Chang is Chief Executive Officer of Korea's Mail Broadcasting Network, uh, better known as MBN. Mr. Chang sees a problem in internet portals controlling access to news. He says monopolies have emerged, creating information imbalances that deprive people of the opportunity to receive quality information, and he's calling for a new ecosystem in the news industry, one that rewards news sources for providing high-value content. Emilar Gandhi is public policy manager responsible for the Southern African Development Community at Facebook that covers 16 
southern African countries. Ms. Gandhi points out that economic and cultural factors exacerbate information inequality in Africa. For many, she says, the cost of accessing internet content is prohibitive, and the media content often has little or no relevance for local communities. And finally, a man you've already heard from this morning, Peter Limburg is Director General of Deutsche Welle. Mr. Limburg notes that access to unbiased information is a basic human right. He says, ruling regimes in several countries have gained control of the media agenda, establishing monopolies on public information. He cites Iran, China, Russia, Turkey, and Egypt as examples of countries where it's nearly impossible for people to get objective information from state-controlled media. A warm hand for all of our guests today. Now, I'm going to be putting some questions to the panelists. The panelists, of course, are free to put questions to one another and to follow up and, and rebut. But you, too, are invited to contribute. Um, I'm sure that most of you, if not all of you, have downloaded the DW Global Media Forum app on your phones. And in that app, there's the opportunity to submit questions to our Twitter wall. Uh, so please feel free to do that. And we'll, we'll be collecting those. and. Uh, and perhaps bring them in towards the end. We're going to leave about 20 minutes towards the end uh, to, to bring in your input. So let's get started. Mr. Chung, I'd like to begin with you. I'm really glad you're here from South Korea because uh, that right now is at very much the center of global news. Many people are, are watching what's going on in the Korean Peninsula and discussions regarding a possible reconciliation between the North and South very intensely. Now, you, you have, um, the Korean Peninsula is really interesting because it provides one of the best illustrations of information inequality on the planet uh, between North and South. Describe to us just how different the media environment is for South Koreans versus North Koreans. Thank you. Uh, South Korea is very open society and many information from public sector and private sector are open to the public. Furthermore, there are uh, many news organizations. There are uh, more than 160 newspapers and nine national TV uh, stations and three news agencies and there are more uh, internet newspapers and local TV stations. They are all freely covering a story. In information and news production, we have diverse, lively ecosystem. News consumption, on the other hand, uh, especially in the internet news consumption, it is highly monopoly market. According to a recent survey, about 90% of internet news consumption is made on major, two major portals. Only 2.4% of internet users answer that they directly go to the news organization's website. This is, I would say, this is a seriously monopoly in news distribution. Uh, North Korea, um, Information and news is very limited. They're closed society and only get news from government's news, uh, owned newspapers and TV stations. They do not have internet access outside their country. So there is no Google, Facebook, um, and other portals and media in North Korea. However, uh, I've heard that Korean drama and K-pop uh, con contents are, are smuggled in the black market in North Korea. And um, it is becoming very popular in North Korea. That's what I've heard. Okay. So some, uh, some content, at least, is sliding through into the North. I want to come back to your suggestion about about monopolization of access in South Korea. We'll talk about that in a, li in a little while. But I want to stick with what's going on in terms of a diplomatic thaw between the North and South. And I wanted to put a question to you, Mr. Limburg. Um, we all know that tomorrow we're expecting to have a, a summit. We're seeing a, 
a meeting between, an unprecedented meeting between the North Korean leader and an American president. North Korea, Korean leader Kim Jong-un is expected to meet U.S. President Donald Trump in Singapore. Do you think that meeting could have a positive effect in efforts to overcome the information inequalities between the North and the South? Well, um, as a Catholic, I'm, I'm, I'm still believing in miracles, but... Um, um, as, a, as a professional journalist, I, I have my doubts. I mean, these two, two people uh, haven't already proven their approach to liberal and free media. So I, I have my doubts that they are the ones who, who will bring, bring on um, the, the, the big, new, wonderful world. Um, I mean, it is a very risky thing what they're doing. On the other hand, it's always better to talk than to... to uh, uh, get missiles to, to one in, uh, another. So I think um, probably it's a, it's a good thing that they meet, but um, we shouldn't expect too much of it, uh, especially not for free media. And uh, um, the U.S. president has proven that he, that he acts more like, uh, like an autocrat when it comes to media. And, uh, well, the record of, of uh, the Korean leader is... is, is Definitely worse, but uh, I think they are not the ones who should be uh, uh, the, the, the icons of free media in this world. Okay, I'd like to move on a bit from current affairs and talk about something that's even more universal and affecting us all. We have representatives of Facebook and Google on our panel today, and I want to—I'm very glad that both of you have, have, have joined us. Uh, I want to begin with you. Ms. Autret, um, Google, or Alphabet as your parent company uh, is now known, it's worth nearly $780 billion. It's a massive company. It's become the dominant digital gatekeeper, some would say, for news and information. How can you assure, and this is a question that on, is on many people's minds, how can you assure that media funneled through your platform is journalistically sound and balanced and doesn't amplify information inequality? Um, so I think recently we've, we've announced some um, initiative at the global level, which uh, was a graduation of the digital news initiative in Europe. And part of that, uh, one thing is to elevate quality information on our platform. And the way we do that uh, is by um, slightly tweaking the algorithm in the event, in live events, where we take the two components of the algorithm, one being relevance, and the other one being authoritativeness. And we, we up the dial on authoritativeness in the, in the, the events uh, that are happening live. Uh, so it's never going to be a 100% foolproof um, you know, system. Um, but I think what we're trying to do is to ensure that you know, the, the sources uh, that have been indicated as authoritative have a higher ranking. There are many other efforts, but I'm just going to, to stay on that one point for now. Okay. Um, I'd like to put basically the same question to you, Ms. Gandhi. Uh, how do you go about assuring? I mean, you know, Facebook is huge. It has 2 billion users, a market cap of uh, over 550 billion in terms of its market value. How do you go about assuring that your users don't end up in very narrow echo chambers, very narrow news corridors that distorts their perception of reality and exposes them to misleading content and disinformation? Okay, uh, that's an inequality there of me not actually knowing how to uh, operate this. Um, so, in Africa, we have um, over 124 million people using our platform every month. And 90% of those people use our platforms using mobile. Uh, and that informs how we approach false news uh, in general. Um, but I would also want just to get back to what our mission is as Facebook, which is to give power to people to build community uh, and to connect to the world. And that mission also informs how we, we, um, how we ensure that we fight false news. But beyond that, what also came up even uh, before this panel is um, issues around language, issues around context and, and you know, cultural um, environment in which we are working in. 
So in Africa, we do work with local, um, local entities. We do work with the local ecosystem to ensure that we produce tools and resources that are locally relevant. Any content that is produced on the internet and is not linguistically relevant is useless. So what we, we do not produce content, but we obviously we do work with different stakeholders to ensure that uh, whatever is produced is something, what we know for sure is that when people come to Facebook, they want to see uh, correct, you know, if they can read something that they can trust uh, when they come to Facebook. Um, and we also working around, you know, de-ranking some information that, you know, that is, that is false. But usually, um, uh, false news is spread around by fake accounts, and it's something that we are really, really working with across the region, across Africa, to ensure that uh, people know that, you know, you have to use your real name when you're on our platforms, um, and, and how do we ensure that that information, even though uh, we are not as many uh, within the company, can filter down to, to all the people. But hmm. what I can also say is that beyond the false news, um, information inequality is multi-layered. And it being multi-layered, as a company, as a private company, we also have to work with the different sectors, different stakeholders, to ensure that we uh, come up with solutions that can, um, you know, that are relevant to, to the people that use our platform. I'd like to fo follow that up, if you don't mind, to talk about um, what you're dealing with specifically in Southern Africa. I mean, Southern Africa is, is largely stable, but there are also a number of, of countries where there are conflicts uh, going on. Uh, you know, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Mozambique, Angola. How do you ensure that your platform doesn't get exploited or blocked in a propaganda war? So uh, one thing uh, effect is uh, Africa is not a country, and Africa is not monolithic. So it's 54 countries, 48 in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, 16 in SADC, uh, the Southern African region, and with different contexts and different environments. Uh, and whatever we have, not as a solution, but what we think we can do, we, we have to work with the local people. We have to work with the local government, with the local NGOs, with the local academics. Well, what if your local government happens to be a dictator that is um, you know, waging a, a, a cruel war against the people? Yeah, but you, you still have to talk to the people that, uh, you still have to talk to the authorities to find out uh, hmm. what the problem is. You find that sometimes most of the reasons why the internet is shut down is a result of fake news. I'm saying fake news like this because it's, it's um, defined in a, in a different manner. It doesn't mean that when uh, you, you, you perceive me as a dictator, then you, you, won't, uh, you won't talk to me. So we talk with different uh, stakeholders to, to find out what the problem is. Um, and one of the issues that causes uh, real world harm is related to online safety. And in South Africa, where I'm based, uh, we do have issues around uh, sextortion, around um, online safety issues around yeah. teenagers. And we actually working with uh, schools to ensure that uh, some of the programs that we already have are in a context that they can understand, that in a language that they can understand. Now that's, yes. that's an important issue too, and, uh, um, and I'm, I'm sure that that's going to be talked about here at the Global Media Forum in, in quite a number of, of panels too. Perhaps we'll come back to, to the question uh, about how to operate in, in difficult environments, but uh, let's keep the discussion a, a bit broader uh, again, talking about um, corporations and and how they operate in this environment. Because uh, you know, we have Google and Facebook here on, on, on the panel. Uh, many are asking a quest the question in, in our society, is should regulation of media and digital platforms uh, be entrusted to just a few powerful organizations that design online architecture behind closed doors according to algorithms that are driven by advertising logic? Let me ask you that, Mr. Limbaugh. How do you feel about that? Um, I, I personally, I'm, I'm not the, the one who is an advocate for, for regulating everything. But uh, first of all, there's one thing is very clear. Um, Google and Facebook are monopolists. And uh, this makes it uh, difficult to work with. I mean, in fact, you are a monopolist. Um, and uh, this is something which in, in the history doesn't always work well out. So, so one should be, be conscious also at Google and Facebook that uh, this is a great time to make a lot of money, but there could be 
becoming much more pressures also from, from governments on regulations. And first of all, the situation which we have now with Google and Facebook is still preferable than the regulations made by China, for instance. So we always have to, to keep in mind that for the moment we have with Google and Facebook, people who just want to have a, have a great business model and uh, want, to, want to fulfill the needs of their customers, which is totally fair enough. So I don't see any, anything bad in it. But um, when they don't see the responsibility which they have as, uh, um, as monopolists, um, the pressure will rise um, on them, I'm, I'm quite sure. And uh, so I, I, I really urge those companies to, um, to see that uh, um, they have to at least not hinder with their algorithms the, the spread of fr the free flow of information and they should not uh, work against uh, companies um, who are doing fair and objective journalism. So, but this can turn out. I mean, if you, if you just switch one thing on your, on your algorithm and we don't know in advance, the traffic goes down dramatically. When we're lucky, the traffic goes up. But it's, it's something which we cannot, we, 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 we're not even able to participate. When you say we, you're, you mean Deutsche Welle? I mean content. Deutsche Welle, mm -hmm. I mean BBC, whatever. I mean uh, a lot of outlets uh, there who try to, to do fair and, and balanced journalism. And also in your own home countries, it's not only international broadcasters, but uh, um, I would really uh, like to see more efforts from these big platforms to encourage free journalism and the freedom of expression towards people who just spread their, their fake news or whatever. So, Trent, I'm sure you'd like to respond to that. Yes, of course. Um, so, I hope you, we, you consider Google as um, a child of the open web. This is very much going back to our mission statement, which is to make the world's information universally uh, accessible and useful. Um, and this is very much something we live by on, in everything we do. Um, and so um, we take our responsibility very seriously um, when it comes to, you know, the, the search world um, and the things, the initiatives we do with the news industry. Um, one thing we did, um, you know, in terms of uh, keeping uh, that open web is the accelerated mobile pages uh, open standard. And this is very much, you talked about, you know, collaboration and coalition. This is very much, you know, us reaching out to the publishers community and as well the advertisers to try to build that, uh, you know, open um, standard for making the mobile web great uh, and good. You also touch on uh, free journalism. So this is very much part of our mission. That said, we're also um, building some tools to help with uh, subscription models because this is very much a trend that you know, most publishers adopt across the world. Um, and so when I say uh, Google is very pro-open web, it doesn't necessarily mean free, but it could mean you know, um, behind a subscription wall. And so uh, Terry and I discussed you know, that uh, very uh, dilemma because as a personal citizen, I do worry about these two, um, you know, um, what's the word I'm looking for, stage worlds, where you have a world where the wealthy access good quality journalism, and then everybody else doesn't have access to that. But I take um, hope and optimism in the fact that there are hybrid models emerging from the US, also the Guardian uh, in the UK, where they're really tapping into the donation so that they can keep their, you know, their journalism for free. Um, so, yeah, I hope that gives you some answers. And also, you know, when it comes to regulation, we believe in innovation, which is why we launched the, the, the Digital News Initiative, which is trying to spur innovation within the whole ecosystem uh, and come up with solutions. Mr. Chung, you, you represent a, a commercial media entity in Korea. Uh, it's an extremely important source of, of information for people in that country. When we were talking ahead of this panel, you were explaining to me the difficulties you face, and you mentioned it in your, in your opening statement too, the difficulties you face 
coping with internet portals that are restricting certain access or not rewarding you, and you're calling for a new model to allow media providers to be rewarded for quality media content. What exactly do you have in mind? Um, I recently, um, you may heard about the Steemit, that's the blockchain-based social media network, and they reward the cryptocurrency to the content providers, and also um, those who uh, comment on the content, and even those who press the like button, they get the um, compensation. So those kind of ecosystem will um, make content providers to sustain, stay sustainable in the market. I, th I think it's important for many here who are not familiar with uh, the South Korean, the way the media operates in South Korea. As you were explaining it to me, unlike here, where you, unlike a Google, uh, most people don't use Google to, to access the internet apparently in South Korea. It's also a language uh, issue. So there are other internet portals that are very restrictive and they link everything into their sites. So they create an internal ecosystem that creates indeed a, a kind of a, a bubble. How, how restrictive is that system? Um, in, in Korea, there's a um, like Korean portal. Um, one portal has the, the market share about, above 70% of the internet news um, consumption. So how, they, how it works is they buy the contents for very low um, cost from the content providers like newspapers, TV stations, and they put it uh, on their website for free. So um, all the, the, the co visitors can read all the contents from news organizations for free. So, um, and we think that they're not compensating enough for, for us. Hmm. So that is kind of the problem. Okay, there's a big discussion right now about when it comes to accessing information online, uh, news information in particular, uh, there's curated content about what the user is able to actually access or not. When you put in the search for this, an algorithm determines that you get these certain results. And there's a question of whether humans should be involved in curating the content or whether artificial intelligence might do that better. This is a huge issue for Google right now, which has made attempt, I mean, for, excuse me, for Facebook at, uh, right now, which has made different attempts and, and just recently also abandoned uh, one of the attempts. Can you talk about that a little, Ms. Gandhi, about how you approach the whole question of curating news and controlling what, what users are able to access through what they experience in terms of access to information on your platform? Yeah, so um, I'll just also um, mention that um, I think when, when we talk about uh, algorithms, machine learning, artificial intelligence, we should also, um, you know, we should also accept that there are benefits uh, in those technologies. And um, we, we need not to regulate the, the technology itself, uh, the, the technology itself, and also um, accept that uh, all these technologies are part of our daily lives. It's not something new, uh, and it's not something that uh, is new because of Facebook, but it's been already part, part of our lives. There are concerns, of, of course, and there are issues that you know, people raise, and there are policy concerns around that, uh, particularly something that you, you're raising, uh, involvement of human beings, ethics around it, uh, and also tra transparency, as, as you mentioned. But our position as Facebook is that, um, uh, you know, we, we need to, uh, we need to uh, look at the benefits that these technologies uh, bring for us, the, the technologies that bring for development, particularly in uh, developing countries, particularly in Africa, where uh, we, we are facing challenges in terms of access. And some of those challenges have been mentioned here already, around awareness, around uh, inclusivity, around affordability in terms of access. And how can we ensure that those technologies that spare innovation can enable people who are, or some parts of society that cannot 
access information to access it, uh, particularly um, people who are blind um, or use of uh, data in disaster areas. As you know, some of the countries that you mentioned that I'm responsible for are disaster prone. How can we ensure that data that we use uh, in those situations can be uh, used in a developmental manner. But we also believe that technology, and we are speaking, I think, uh, around technology is something that is abstract. But we also believe as a company that, you know, technology is about people. Uh, and without people, without involvement mm. of people, then um, it's, it's pretty useless. Okay, without the involvement of people, that's a great way to get our audience involved right now. Um, just, just so you know, we are, there is going to be lunch being served just outside. We're going to uh, spend the next 15 minutes or so uh, bringing in your input. I'm going to first uh, to see if we've got anything coming in for, on, our, on our Twitter uh, wall. Apparently nothing at this point. So what I would ask is that uh, I hope we have some people with microphones in the audience. If not, I, yeah, we do. Great, so we've got some help here. I'd like to ask you to raise your hand if you have a question to any of our panelists and um, I will pick you out and try to pick, out, pick you out in order. I see a hand already down front. I would ask you to put your, try to keep your question very brief, okay? This is, I would love to have a question or a very brief statement, but you know, please don't uh, take up all the time. And we'll collect a few questions, put them to the panelists. I see a couple of more, great. And uh, yes, please, please state your name, uh, where you're from, what you do, and who your question is directed towards. So let's start with the gentleman right there. Exactly, the, the microphone just arrived. Merci beaucoup. Je suis Franck Kenevo du Bénin. Je voudrais demander comment est-ce que... I'm, I'm sorry, I, I have to interrupt you because I'm afraid that we... I'm, I don't know if everyone here speaks uh, French and we don't have translation uh, headsets, so that would... It would, it would be for me, unfortunately, a bit of a problem. Go ahead. Um, we, Mr. Limburg. Oh, we have, we have a native French speaker who's going to offer to translate, so do try to keep it concise. Yeah. Okay, d'accord. Lorsque... Uh, les gouvernements, surtout dans certains pays, mettent beaucoup de pression sur les médias publics. When the government uh, put pressure on the, sorry, on, on what? On sur les médias publics. On the media, on the public media. Et, et, et les... Où? Where? Euh, uh, où? Dans certains pays. In, in certain countries. Et, et donc, les oblige à ne pas donner la parole à l'opposition et... et contrôle de fait l'information qui est diffusée sur ces médias-là. Comment est-ce qu'un journaliste dans de tels contextes peut s'organiser Okay, and so then the government forces those media not to publish the opposing uh, view. So how can a journalist uh, go around that and um, and make sure that his content is viewed by people Who is the uh, la question est pour qui Ah, merci beaucoup, oui. <laughs> Um, I, will, I will answer in English if it's okay. Um, so, uh, yes, this is one of the biggest problems we have. And first of all, it's easy to sit here in, 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 in Bonn in a, in, a, in, a, in a great conference room and say it needs a lot of courage for a journalist to work there. And, but this is it. Uh, first of all, you, you have to be a courageous journalist uh, to, to go uh, into these situations and, and uh, also to criticize the government or um, to, to point out to corruption where corruption is and, uh, and to other scandals. So, but I think this is something also where international media comes into, into place. We see it as our task that we go also more and more into, into uh, countries where this is exactly the case. So we play a role there and it's not only Deutsche Welle, it's also uh, notre, notre collègue Francaise and, and, and the BBC. So um, I think uh, this is our role to go there and help these journalists and also give the platform for this information because yes, in certain states uh, uh, these information cannot be published. So I think this is our role for this free flow of information which we talked about. So. Thank you for the question. So there is a, first a question uh, back there, was there? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Alan Sowell from the Tax Justice Network. Um, yeah, I, I hear that Google and Facebook, they have revenues in 
uh, hundreds of billions of dollars. And I hear that um, quality journalism is being starved of cash. Um, these are very real worries. Um, is there any way that some kind of tax model could provide revenue to quality journalism? Would you like to direct that to any particular panelist, or should we open it? Uh, to the Google and Facebook um, panelists. Um, I'll start. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, so we abide by laws in uh, every country, um, and our chairman, Eric Schmidt, uh, published an op-ed, I think, last year or the year before, where he made a call for um, global harmonization of taxes, so um, that, uh, you know, that would address the fair share of uh, taxes. On the point for specifically funding uh, journalism, I don't think this is a question for me. This is more a question for uh, regulators. I, the one thing I would say, though, is uh, we are trying to um, fund innovation so that the media organizations find ways to... Uh, to sustainable solution to the, you know, the, the constraint of the advertising market. And this is why recently we announced some uh, product innovation around subscription as well, to try to give some tools uh, to um, increase the, the number of people who can pay for content. Just quickly, um, you know, just, just quickly to answer to the gentleman there, we do have... Uh, I, I'm not sure if he's listening. Uh, we do have, uh, maybe he's on Facebook. We, we, uh, we do have a, a, an online safety uh, program for journalists. That's specifically for journalists, something that you can look at around lo your location, around privacy, you know, ensuring that your privacy settings are, you know, are, are private to ensure that, you know, you're safe uh, online and also uh, offline. And to answer to the gentleman there, um, as Facebook, we do pay Texas where, where we are best. Um, but one thing that we, I would also want to just highlight there is that is the Facebook Journalism Project. Uh, and we can, I know we, we've run out of time, but we can talk about it offline. Uh, you, and you can also just look at it. Um, and we, we would want to work with journalists around also research uh, to ensure that uh, some of the issues that you're actually coming up with do, are actually backed up with research. Uh, and uh, we, we ensure that we work together. But in, in ensuring, you know, we, we meet some of your goals and we also meet some of our goals. So I think what's important there is actually having a partnership and working together uh, if, if something that you can take away from this. Okay. If I might just, just uh, um, add on it, I'm, uh, I personally don't think that um, taxes given out for, for free journalism, private journalism, is the solution because uh, journalism should always have the, the possibility of refinancing itself. So uh, I'm speaking now, I, I, 20 years of my life I spent in private television, so I know what I'm talking about. And uh, this is very important. And I, I have my doubts, and I see that a lot of people here in Germany, uh, uh, publishers uh, uh, from private companies, don't want to have tax money uh, from, they might like to have some tax reductions or something, but they don't want to have be refinanced actively, because I think this is still something where, where we have a good separation. We're public broadcasters, we like to obviously take uh, public money, yes, but I think, uh, um, uh, and what, 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 what we just heard is, is, is right, Google is investing also in, in collaboration um, uh, with, with partners uh, in the Google News Initiative, for instance, so, which is a good thing, but uh, probably uh, not enough yet, but well, we see. No, but uh, basically, uh, the, I see efforts also from, 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 from especially Google, um, because we, we're also partnering with it, and, and, and hopefully also from Facebook, that something goes into this direction, but uh, um, I'm not a fan of tax money going into private uh, uh, companies. Can I, can I just add something to that? The Very briefly, please, because there are a number of yes. people wanting to still ask questions. Sustainability is the key here. We don't want, you know, we want something that is for the long term, and this is what we're trying to do through the collaboration. Okay, first here, and then I think we had one gentleman there, and I'm kind of seeing people towards the front, but I would like to get something from the other side of the room. We'll move one, this gentleman here in the So first to you, sir. Uh, my name is Khalid Amit Farooqi. I work for uh, Geo Television Pakistan. is also a newspaper publication, Jangroof newspaper. Uh, 
my particular question is uh, regarding media monopolization what we have seen now what is started in 1990s in america that uh, the public uh, takeover of public expression by the corporate now six groups with 146 billion dollar controlling the world media and building particular narrative uh, and there is very big war in Yemen, which has completely disappeared from the map because Saudi Arabia is a very powerful, rich country, and also Americans in, in the, during the Middle East war. How are we going to solve the problem of independent journalism when market completely directing the media, journalists, jobs in journalism, and the production of journalism? How are we going to solve this problem that particular powerful countries media narrative is just dominating the scene and waging wars and particularly in war narrative. Thank you. And would you, um, are you directing that towards any particular person on the panel? I, I, I particularly Mr. Peter Limburg. Okay. Yes, just, just shortly, yes, this is a big problem when all the revenues uh, from, from, from uh, digital media goes to, to, let's say, Google and Facebook and local um, people don't get enough revenues. So. This is a big problem. I don't have a, have a, have a solution, uh, but this is what I say. There is growing pressure on, uh, on those companies that they will face regulations. So I think uh, the, the good, uh, the best thing is also, if I, if I may advise you, that you go out into these markets and uh, find partner models uh, which, are, which are maybe more sustainable for these um, local local um, uh, journalists so uh, and publishers so they can live from from their work the gentleman there mm -hmm. uh, please allow me to introduce myself first i am gazanfar ali khan and i'm an indian journalist but i'm working in saudi arabia uh, first my special thanks goes to german federal office particularly to mr peter limbaugh for hosting such an international conference where we are all sitting and brainstorming at the moment. My question is that, uh, especially in terms of the contents online, at the moment if you are take the search engine and go for searching something, either on Google or anywhere, you come out with something like you, you put one word and you get 1,000 responses. My personal assessment is that 75 to 90 percent of the responses you got in response to your search are either concocted or misleading or if not then at least some of the informations are inaccurate full of fallacies full of inaccuracies that again bring the question here of media auditing media sincerity and all that so the future where you know fresh practitioners of journalism say for example a fresher who joins a newspaper or a television goes to the google search something gets a wrong answer it's a very common thing and then he goes with that my question is that is there any way that we can sit in conjugation do some brainstorming to check these kinds of mushrooming fake concocted information online and on the other hand the cyber uh, space is also being choked every day, completely clogged. It's, so what measures we have? It's, it's a major concern that, uh, that we all share. And I, when I was talking with you, Ms. Otret, earlier, you said that your company is, a, is, this is a major, major concern for Google. How are you dealing with it? Um, so I think we work with partners. We don't work in isolation. And so we've worked with media companies. We've worked with Facebook. First draft um, has, you know, uh, come out with a definition of seven types, categories of misinformation. And I think you, you need to have different answers for different types of misinformation. Um, so one of the things we're doing is uh, for the completely fabricated, uh, you know, uh, misinformation, they, they can't get access to our ad networks. You know, they're blacklisted. So that's the first thing. When it comes to signaling to the user, um, I think this is uh, a difficult question. So we uh, invest into some uh, fact-checking um, collaboration 
where you know the media organization then can use those signals to to have to the user um, but I think I hope you would agree that you don't want us to be the arbitrator of truth so there needs to be some some uh, system out there that will you know categorize the information that we can use uh, in a search engine world uh, the last thing I would mention is the trust project so this is uh, uh, something that we've uh, participated and um, uh, helped financially. This is run out of the Santa Monica University, and they've got you know 80 media organisation across the world working on you know also coming up with those criteria, and hopefully those signals can then be passed to the search engine, not just Google. Okay, I think we have time for just a couple more questions. Uh, uh, this gentleman here has been waiting patiently, and you first, and Thank then you. Uh, from the back there, I think, uh, with the mic, yeah, Richard. Uh, Sir Don Sanderson with Deutsche Welle. I'm a journalist working here. Um, we've had some uh, reactions on Twitter that I would just like to run by you and hopefully get some reactions okay. from you. Uh, we've had one participant say uh, they're surprised that people have to be reminded of Africa's diversity. Why should they always have to know that there's more than dictatorship and difficult environs to Africa? Another participant said, yes, Africa is not a country, even when it comes to digital do we, we're talking about filter bubbles here, but when it comes to our own perception of Africa, a fast-growing digital environment, are we living in a bubble of our own ignorance? And this uh, question is obviously directed at uh, Ms. Gandhi and also maybe Ms. Autre. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if, if that's really a question. I, I think Africa is more than dictatorships. Africa is more than challenges. It uh, is diverse. Uh, like the participants said, um, it, there are more there are opportunities uh, there. And as Facebook, we don't just work with um, you know the, the false news and internet shutdowns and all that. We support a lot of small businesses. Um, you know, we work with uh, developers as well to ensure that uh, we work with developer circles to ensure that um, you know whatever we are doing is informed by the continent itself. In, in Africa, there are over 27 developer circles and 37,000 members, and one of the largest in Lagos across the world, uh, and 50% of those developer circles run, are run by women, bringing in diverse voices, because information inequality is also uh, gender, um, you, know, you know, it's also divided across gender as well. But I think one thing that also we need to uh, ensure, I think, around the challenges that we are facing is prioritizing media literacy, because there's convergence around uh, media and internet. We cannot just talk about uh, focusing on literacy just on Facebook, but also uh, on all media, uh, including working with journalists. Just a, few, just, a few, just a few words at Deutsche Welle. We, we know that Africa is not a country, so first of all. So uh, Africa has 54 countries, and uh, it's, it's very diverse. It's, uh, it's a great place for entrepreneurship, and I think what we, what we can do is help uh, also by information, uh, private media companies, um, also to, to be encouraged because I think they're the future of Africa and uh, when it comes to media. And also what, we, what we'd like to do is show uh, what works in Africa. This is our, our thing which we say constructive journalism. And it's not only about positive news, but for instance, our environmental magazine, Equid Africa, is something which is really, um, really a success story in Africa. A lot of uh, media outlets are broadcasting it. And that we show that things are possible, that there are people working on solutions. And I think especially we know uh, at Deutsche Welle that this is, uh, this is something which is very important for us. Very good. Uh, just one more question back there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hi, uh, Richard Walker. I'm head of news here at Deutsche Welle. I just want to pick up on something that Peter Limburg said earlier about uh, Facebook and Google being de facto monopolists. Um, and I think our guests from Facebook and Google, understandably, didn't really directly address that. So I have a direct question for each of you about that. I mean, we're confronted with the power of Facebook and Google and what that means for us every day in our working uh, life. And when we think sometimes about you know, spreading ourselves across multiple social networks, for instance, we look at Instagram, of course, but of course Instagram belongs to Facebook. So part of the power of your companies is the acquisitions that you've made. I think it's a very interesting case to be made uh, that you should be split up and that Instagram and WhatsApp 
should be separated from Facebook and that YouTube should be separated from Google. So, Mr. Trey, I ask you specifically, why do you think that should not happen? Why does Google need YouTube? Uh, and, Ms. Gandhi, why does Facebook also need Instagram and WhatsApp? Why does Facebook... Yeah, so, Ms. So Trey, first. Um, so I'm, I'm going to be cheeky and ask you a question in return. <laughs> um, would you, was it, is it fair to say that all of the products that we have are focusing on the user and bringing something good for the user? Um, I'm sorry, no, I asked you the question. I mean, of course, I'm familiar with the tactic, but um, in this case, uh, I mean, you can do something, your, your intentions can be as benign uh, as can be, but you're a private corporation. Leadership can change, that can change. I think, I think it's a question that I think a lot of people have in mind. You know, the power of these companies is enormous. It dwarfed Standard Oil in the early part of the 20th century when Standard Oil was divided up. So I throw the question back to you. Why do you need, I mean, uh, uh, Google, an enormous company in itself, why do you also need YouTube? Okay, so I think underlying in your question is uh, about the advertising, the monopolistic view of the advertising, if I may paraphrase, but maybe it's not. I don't think so. It's, it's a near monopoly. <laughs> you are gatekeepers to information through, uh, in Google, in terms of raw information and YouTube obviously specializing in video. Um, I'm not talking about advertising. I'm talking about you as the, the gatekeeper to the world for information. That's a tough one. Um, I would uh, argue that uh, we give access to the information and we also we, we give access to the free open web. And at the premise, I think this is a very good thing. This fosters freedom of speech. This fosters, you know, a plurality of opinions across the world. So I, I can't answer your question. Why do we need YouTube? Uh, I don't know, but ultimately, you know, Google is focusing on the user, and we're bringing to the user great products that gives them access to the information. And I can elaborate on the advertising piece because I think underlying this is the crux of all the questions that you know are aim, aimed at us. Uh, but maybe we can have question. that offline. <laughs> yes, of course. I'd be very happy to. <laughs> I mean, I mean, what Richard is expressing is, is, is a concern that uh, Mr. Limburg has already mentioned, that the idea that we are putting our access to information in the hand of a very few extremely powerful I, content providers just, in the world, and, we, and people are simply concerned about Can that. I just challenge you on this? Mm. There is a technical thing called Robert Text File, which gives you the control over whether you want to be on Google. You, you have sure. the power. What we do um, is we send traffic to you as a media organization. I do hope to have this conversation with you perhaps when, over lunch today, but I would like to first give Ms. Gandhi uh, a chance to yeah. reply to, to oh, Richards. And, and I know I'm, being, uh, I'm, I'm the block between you and lunch, so I'll be quick. This is a very tough <laughs> question. <laughs> uh, this is a very tough question, but um, as you know, the different platforms, even they are part of obviously a Facebook a family of apps, but serving different, um, you know, different uh, needs altogether. And perhaps it can be uh, a theme for next year for uh, the global uh, media forum. But uh, different users, not users, different people uh, use the different platforms for, for, for uh, you know, differently. We're talking about information inequality, and we're talking about the, some of the challenges that we have in the developing countries. And these three platforms that you mentioned have different uh, kind of technologies. And someone was telling me, I think yesterday, that they, don't, they hardly use WhatsApp in, in German or hardly use WhatsApp in, in the States. But in Africa, WhatsApp is like the app that people use because of, uh, you, know, the ease of you know, the ease of use and uh, in terms of data cost. Uh, and I can see you want to an answer, to, to question something else, but can we do it offline? But, you know, different uh, users for different people. Do we actually need it? Um, that's probably a conversation for another day. 
I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. We uh, are almost at quarter after one, and uh, we're going to have to wrap it up. I want to thank all of our panelists for your input and your thoughts, and I'm sure this conversation will continue on different levels here at the Global Media Forum over the next uh, three days. Uh, Emina Gandhi, uh, Peter Limburg, Song Jun Chang, and Benedict Otret, thank you all for joining us. And I want to uh, draw your yeah, a warm round of applause to all our guests here. And I want to point out, uh, I think we have a couple of pictures that we're going to play for you here at the very end. There's a super interesting photo exhibition in the tunnel between the new building and the old building of this venue that illustrates visually some of the equalities that we find in the world. Uh, Johnny Miller is the photographer. He's on hand this afternoon at 3.30, tomorrow at 3.30 as well in the tunnel to talk to you about his photos. Perhaps we can show some of those. There we go, on the screen. Thank you so much.